All right, gang, this lecture is huge because we're gonna go in deep on some more processes in visual perception. Before we begin, I'd like you to find a couple of objects in your house that are long in one dimension and have two different lengths and get them close to you. I'm gonna use a pen and a tube of chapstick. Anything that have different lengths will work fine. So pens, uh, a nail, a bobby pin, even like the edge of your phone would work fine. Get them ready now and we'll use those a bit later on. We have now tackled how light is transduced, how we perceive color, how we take information from the photoreceptors and convey that up higher into the brain, and how we perceive motion. Our next topic is dealing with depth and size. So we have been bottom up heavy through opponent process theory and motion selective circuits, etc. And today we're going to start getting more into the good top down stuff. So today and in the next class period, we'll be focused on how we go beyond the information that's given and use those top down influences to guide our perceptions. So to begin, I would like to imagine that you and your eyeballs are standing out in a forest and you're looking at a tree off in the distance. We refer to the tree as the distal stimulus. That is the real object out in space that you're seeing. Now, the information that your brain gets about the tree, the tree is going to be a function of the activity from the photoreceptors that it stimulates. So your brain can't see the tree. Right? It's just getting information about the amount and type of light that is present on one region of the retina. So we refer to that information as the proximal stimulus. That is the pattern of energy on your sensory receptors. So you don't actually see the distal stimulus, you see the proximal stimulus. Your brain is getting the pattern act of activity from the photoreceptors in that particular region of the retina. That information will include the size on the retina, closer objects, larger objects take up more of the visual field, and the location in the visual field. It will also include information about color and motion. Now you might think this distinction between what I'm seeing, whether it's proximal or distal, this seems like a silly distinction, right? Am I seeing the object out in space or am I seeing the activity on the retina? But here's where that distinction really matters. That same proximal stimulus can be caused by this big lovely tree that you're looking at far away, or it be, could be caused by a slightly smaller tree that's somewhat closer, or it could be caused by a little bonsai tree that's, that's really close. So the activity on the retina can't distinguish between those stimuli. All of those different distal stimuli result in the same proximal stimulus. So the challenge is that the proximal stimulus is ambiguous. We've got a two-dimensional retina and we need to represent a three-dimensional world. So any proximal image could be caused by a number of different distal stimuli. Let's demonstrate this using our two objects. I want you to close one eye and move the small object closer to you and the large object farther away until they're taking up the same amount of the visual field. For me, it's about at this distance. They're both taking up the same amount of visual field. The size of the proximal stimulus is the same. They're tickling the same number of photoreceptors. So the challenge is, how do we know that this is a big one far away and this is a little one closer up? There are lots of things in the world that can cause the same proximal stimulus. Or put in another way, the same proximal stimulus can be interpreted in many different ways. So we have the proximal stimulus and we're trying to guess where in the world is that? So there are a number of challenges that this poses. First, given the very limited, ambiguous stimulus that gets to our retina, how do we know how big objects out in the real world are? We'll talk about a few ways that we can do this, but the first is that we can evaluate size by comparing objects to surrounding objects, by comparing it to nearby objects. So this is referred to as size contrast. When trying to evaluate the size of objects, we look to the objects around them as a reference. The classic demonstration of size contrast is the Ebbinghaus illusion. Which orange circle appears bigger, the one on the left or the one on the right? Guess what? Yes, they're the same size. How about this? Wow, Shaq is really big. Wait, no, Shaq is small? So things look smaller when they're next to big things and bigger when they're next to small things. Here's another one. This is called the Jastrow illusion. Which of these is bigger? What's that I hear? You're saying this one? Cool, all right. How about now? What? Now this one is bigger? Wait, what? Now this one is bigger? Guess what? Yep, actually, they're the same size. So what we appear to be doing is comparing the two surfaces that are closest to one another, this one and this one. So the shorter line seems particularly short when it's compared to this larger line. All right, so looking at nearby objects may be helpful in some situations, but we also see objects in isolation and across a range of contexts. So couldn't we just say that big things take up more of our visual field, so if more photoreceptors are being activated, that means the thing is bigger? 
Yeah, but that doesn't work because the same size object takes up different amounts of space depending on how far away it is. So that tree is the same size in the real world. The distal stimulus is the same in both contexts, but it takes up different amounts of retinal space depending on how close it is. So the most powerful cue we have for knowing how big things are is knowing how far away they are. So we can combine the proximal stimulus with our assumptions about depth to arrive at a best guess about size. But we need some mechanism for dealing with the fact that as things get farther away, they make a smaller proximal stimulus. If we didn't have a mechanism for dealing with this, we'd have the terrifying illusion that people shrink as they walk away. Oh no, my hand, it's growing, make it stop. But the science section of the satirical magazine, The Onion, tells us that in fact, people who are far away from you are not actually smaller. If you can believe it, this human is the same size when he's close, or when he's far, he's 5'10 either way. You don't believe me? Hold on, let me walk you through this. There are graphs. You see, whether he is four yards away from you or six yards away from you, his height continues to be the same. Now, the reason that this isn't actually surprising to most of us is referred to as size constancy. It's the idea that we still have access to information about the true size of something, even when the size of the proximal stimulus changes. So our mental representation of that object, what we know about that object, is maintained even via changes in distance. So we can, for instance, assume that these two elephants are the same size, right? We know how big an elephant is, even when its actual appearance on the screen is very different. So this is a lot like color constancy that we talked about earlier in this unit. We can like cancel out or see through or adjust to changes in ambient lighting to understand the true color of an object. And here we can see through changes in depth to understand or intuit the true size. So thus far, I've been claiming that we guess how big things are based on the surrounding information and our assumptions about how far away things are. So the next question is, how do we know how far away things are? Right? We can't actually see how far away things are. We can't like echolocate with our eyes. We're not like sending out laser beams that measure the distance between us and objects. So how do we know? Well, we don't ever really know, but we can guess. We can make inferences. And the clues that help us guess are referred to as depth cues. As you read, we can use a number of different depth cues to help us gauge distance. None of these give complete information about distance, but together they can help us make good guesses about how far away things are. There's a copy of this diagram in today's problem set in case you want to have one for your notes. So notice that these depth cues are divided into oculomotor cues, those that we get from the physical structure of the eye, and those that are based on the retinal image. The reading gave you a nice introduction to these concepts, so we'll use our time today to build on the reading and go into more detail about some of these examples. So oculomotor cues are those that we get from the physical structure of the eye. As we talked about earlier in the vision unit, there are changes in the physical structure of the eye depending on how near and far objects are. So as an object comes closer, the ciliary muscles tighten. So as it comes close, you can feel that kind of burn in your lens. Yeah, that burn is telling you something about how far away an object is. And that is, of course, accommodation. So if you focus on something that's really close, you can feel that it is close because your ciliary muscles are, are tightening up in order to keep that, uh, that image in focus. The other oculomotor cue is convergence. So this is when uh, the, the eyes move inward as an object comes closer to us. So as something comes closer and closer, the eyes have to move inward. You have to go kind of cross-eyed in order to maintain focus on it. Note that this definition of convergence is different from neural convergence that we've talked about a lot, where different neurons come together and their signals are combined in a postsynaptic cell. It's also different from perspective convergence, which is a pictorial cue. I'll try to always be specific about which type of convergence I'm referring to, and I apologize for the names. I wasn't in charge. Our next category of depth cues are monocular pictorial cues. They're called monocular because they only require one eye. So rather than being about absolute distance, like accommodation and convergence, these help us place items in space relative to one another. The example I showed on the first day with the cylinder and the block, the clue of occlusion is indicating that the red block is farther away than the other one. Now we use these cues we get meaning out of these pictorial cues because they are normally informative. They usually are helpful. They typically give us good information about the, the true state of the world. But there can be cases where these cues lead to perceptions that do not match reality. 
So I'm going to talk about a couple of these monocular depth cues in some more detail and point out situations where they are informative and meaningful and also show illusions that demonstrate situations in which they result in a perception that is not consistent with reality. And recall that the reason that we use these illusions is to show what our buddy Purkinje called the truths of perception. Illusions give us clues about normal perceptual processes. So for example, Shadows can be highly informative because they typically convey meaningful information about items in space. This same image is interpreted quite differently when you just change the location of the shadows. Our interpretation of shadows also seems to be very specific to the situations in which we typically experience them. That is, we appear to have a set of expectations about where shadows will come from. So in this image, which dots look convex and which look concave? Most people will say that the bottom row and the center right dot are concave, like, like they bump in, right? So if you have an object that is concave when it's in this orientation, and then you flip it upside down, it's still concave, right? So if we flip this image over, keep your eyes on those dots, they should stay concave, right? Hmm, and yet when we flip it over, it now seems like the ones we said were concave have become convex. The, the innies have become outies. So this has to do with, with the nature of shadows. In the absence of other input, we tend to assume that light comes from above. So when light is coming from above on a convex image, the darker part is at the bottom. Now, why do we assume that shadows come from above? Well, it's a safe bet that over the course of our lives, light sources, the sun, light fixtures, yep, there they are, tend to come from above. So in the absence of other cues, we assume that shadows happen at the bottom of things even though light sources can come from anywhere. ha 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 ha. Our assumptions about shadows can be so strong that they even lead us to perceive things that we know are impossible. What? So we have this like A-shaped hole in space now, right? It's not actually, it's just a drawing. But the presence of shadows can convey really powerful cues about where things are in space. Don't believe me? Just ask this lady on a flying carpet. Or this hoverboat. All right, we can also use information about the known size of objects to determine how far away they are. So when people are asked to estimate how far away these two coins are, they'll typically judge the quarter to be farther away in space than the dime because they know that quarters are bigger. It's a cool toy car, right? Here's the artist who made that coin. That's a real car. So why didn't we assume that that's a regular car with a huge coin on it? Well, in your life, you have seen toy cars and real cars, and you've seen little coins. Huge coins are really, really unusual. So when we see this image, it could be interpreted in multiple different ways. Toy car, regular coin, regular car, huge coin. But we're choosing the one that seems most likely to be true based on our prior experience. It's a clear top-down effect. The third cue I want to spend some time on today is texture gradient. So pictorial cues are used heavily by painters and other 2D artists who are trying to convey depth. So in this picture, the spacing of the cobblestones gets more densely packed as they get farther away, which contributes to our perception of depth in the image. Texture gradient can also be used for evil, as in this store's carpet. So the ground is flat, but the fact that it doesn't look flat tells us something about how we're using cues about texture to judge depth and distance. One of the most widely used depth cues in art is perspective convergence the idea that parallel lines appear to converge as they get farther away. So in the classic Ponzo illusion, the far yellow line appears to be bigger, even though the two yellow lines are the same size. In my favorite Monsters in the Hallway illusion, the monster that's in the back appears to be much bigger, but they're actually the same size. Isn't this one wild? Look, they're actually, I swear, they're the same size. Okay, this is going to come up later, so I want to emphasize this. Things make smaller proximal stimuli as they get farther away. So we interpret the same sized proximal stimulus as being larger. It feels larger to us when it's farther away because of size constancy. 
One of the things that's really interesting about these depth cues is that they are, as we have said before, cognitively impenetrable, right? Even though you know the trick, you still can't help but see it. It really speaks to the, to the depth of these cues. When painters figured out perspective convergence, it became used as a powerful cue to indicate depth in art. In all of these, the converging lines in the distance are telling us things are getting farther away. So these little guys here, they're not just small floating dudes. They're in the background. How do we know? Perspective convergence. All right, so we've talked about some of the cues that we use to gauge distance. Now let's talk about what can happen when we're given misleading cues about depth. A classic example of false depth cues comes from an illusion called the Ames Room. All right, so the Ames Room is a carefully constructed room that gives visual cues that it's a rectangle, normal size and shape. So the, the way that the pattern on the floor is, the dimensions of the windows, the clock on the wall is all giving visual cues that the room is a normal rectangle. But it is in fact a trapezoid and one corner is much farther away than the other. So when you look through the viewing hole, you're getting visual cues consistent with person A and person B being the same distance away from you, when in fact one of them is much farther. So as a, as a parallel here, if we assume that these two people are the same size, one must be farther away. And when we're given depth cues that one is farther away, it's reasonable to expect that those two people are the same size at different distances. But if we assume that the people are the same distance away, then they must differ in size. So the Ames Room is useful in that it shows us how closely connected our impressions of size and depth are. We're making these inferences about depth and size given ambiguous information. Here's another really nice example. So the reason that your brain kind of goes thunk when each of these things unfolds tells us that we had a set of expectations about what these objects are and how they fit together in the room based on pictorial cues and our prior experiences with these kinds of objects. Another way illusions can reveal our assumptions about size and depth are with forced perspective stimuli. So if you give misleading cues about depth, it can cause misperceptions about size. So here, seeing a person make physical contact with the balloon leads you to believe that they are touching the balloon, so they must be in the same visual plane. They must be the same distance away. So the balloon must be huge. Or if I can hold my research lab on a Frisbee in my hand, they must be quite small. So these can be really compelling uh, and are used, used in the movies heavily too. So in The Lord of the Rings, um, here Frodo looks very small next to Gandalf because the bench that they're sitting on is constructed such that it looks like they're sitting right next to each other. But the bench is actually built so that Frodo is like two feet behind Gandalf. So the reason he's making a smaller proximal stimulus is that he's far away, not that he's hobbit-sized. So this kind of play between size cues and depth cues can really demonstrate how, how interconnected those are and how much we're relying on our expectations about size to judge depth and our expectation about depth to judge size. In addition to these monocular pictorial cues, we also have binocular cues. So there's a clear parallel to be made here with auditory localization, in which we have both monaural and binaural cues for localizing sounds in space, and how having two nostrils helps us localize smell. So for eyes and ears and nostrils, it's double the fun to have two, and it helps us localize where things are in space. So our eyes are set a bit far apart in space, and because of that, they get slightly different pictures of the world. We talked about this in terms of like literally what information the vis each eye is getting, right? We can see farther into the right visual field with the right eye than we can with the left eye, but we also get slightly different perspectives from the two eyes. So in this image on the screen, the left eye is getting, for instance, some wall in between the window and the cactus, and the right eye isn't. So that gives us a clue about where in space the cactus is relative to the house. It's also how these things work. So Viewmasters are this nifty little device 
where we've got a set of pictures and the pictures that are across from each other are of the same scene, but are presented slightly offset. So when I deliver one image to each eye, whoa, those goats, they're, they're just, they're right there. I can almost, I can almost touch them. It's also how 3D movies work. So the old 3D movies projected slightly offset images in red and blue light. And then you wore glasses that have one blue eye and one red eye. So here the red lens is filtering red light. So the right eye is only getting blue light and the blue eye is getting red light. So the two eyes are getting slightly different images that were recorded being offset in space and are now being delivered to, to you offset in space to create the perception of depth. 3D glasses now work somewhat differently. So in modern 3D projections, there are two synchronized projectors that send two respective views onto the screen, each with a different polarization, meaning that the light is filtered to only travel in one orientation. So the glasses only allow one of the images to get to reach each eye because the glasses contain lenses with different polarizations. So we compare the input from our two eyes to help us arrive at where things are in space. Just like we combine information about interaural level differences and interaural time differences to, to, to localize uh, sounds in space as well. But it turns out that we don't treat the input from the two eyes exactly fairly. We tend to prefer the input from one eye over the other. This is referred to as, as ocular dominance. So the information that reaches primary visual cortex, the information that reaches V1, prioritizes one of our eyes over the other. Want to know which eye your brain prefers? Here's how to test it. With both eyes open, hold your hands up in this shape such that some object like that little red dot on the screen is visible in the little gap in your hands. Now close your left eye. Can you still see the image? If so, your right eye dominant. Cl open both eyes, close the right eye. Can you still see the image? If so, your left eye dominant. When you make the call about where to place your hands, you're getting input from both eyes. But the eye you're getting more information from is the one whose view doesn't change whether both eyes are, are open or just that one eye is open. Most people show right eye dominance. And strikingly, this is not correlated with handedness. So left-handed people are just as likely to be right eye dominant as left-handed people are. So the information from both eyes makes it to the brain. We compare the input from those two eyes and those binocular cues are another way that we can arrive at uh, estimates of how far away things are. So here's our summary. If we had to rely on just the proximal stimulus, that is just the bottom up information to figure out where things are, we'd be in trouble because representing the 3D world with a 2D image is going to be ambiguous. Hence, perception is an inference. We're making guesses about what's out there based on our best guesses about size and depth. What is even out there? It's pretty deep, right? See you in class. You know what it's almost like? It's almost like perception is an inference. In both, we're trying to parse ambiguous input. The stimulation of the basal or membrane is a combination of all of the frequencies that are simultaneously present, and they could be caused by lots of different combinations of stimuli. So the proximal stimulus in vision is ambiguous. It could be caused by a large image that's far away or a similar image close up. So in both cases, we're using top-down information to help us resolve the ambiguity in the bottom-up input. Isn't this a good one? They're, they're seriously the same size. I'm not even messing with you, R really. Look, look, see, they're, they're the same. Okay, so we've got a, a number of different depth cues here. We've got relative height, so the back line is higher. We've got relative size based on the posters and the lights. Uh, and from the tiles on the wall, we've got perspective convergence and texture gradient. So here we've got a case where information about depth informs our perception of size. And the Peanuts cartoon is kind of the opposite. So we've got cues about size that are informing our perception of depth. We assume that if the characters were painted normally on the sidewalk, their heads would be smaller than their feet, but they're in proportion, so they must be upright. So this is a case where information about size informs our perception of how far away we think things are. Look at that big, pretty moon. Why does the moon look so big at the horizon? Believe it or not, this is not a simple question to answer. Uh, it doesn't have much of anything to do with the nature of the atmosphere or the angle that light reflect, refracts or anything like that. If you actually measure the moon in the sky, it's that big, it's that big. Uh, it, it isn't actually larger at the horizon than, than directly overhead. So there are two main theories about why the moon looks bigger at the horizon than it does overhead. 
The first is referred to as the apparent distance theory. The claim is that the horizon is perceived as being farther away than the sky overhead. So the reason the moon illusion is working on this image that you're seeing right here is that the horizon is farther away. We can tell because of perspective convergence. Now we perceive things that are far away to be bigger than they actually are because we are perceptually correcting for the small size of the proximal stimulus. So if the horizon is perceived as being farther away than the sky overhead, we would interpret the moon as being bigger when it's there. But why would we think the moon is closer when it's overhead than when it's at the horizon? What would lead to that misperception about distance? So here, I've got no context. How big is that thing? Where is that thing? It could be a million miles away. It could be 239,000 miles away. So what's our context for knowing how far away the sky is? Could the answer be clouds? In an open area, we can see very far to the horizon, but cloud cover is much lower. So low clouds can be as low as a mile overhead, whereas we can see at least three miles to the horizon. And we can see things that are much farther away if they're tall. So the moon looks larger at the horizon because we think it's farther away. And because of size constancy, we're perceptually correcting for that small proximal stimulus. The other theory about the moon illusion, and both theories could be true, is that at the horizon, the moon is surrounded by fine details, which makes it look larger. When it's high in the sky, there's not that context. It's just surrounded by the empty vastness of space. So it may have to do in part with cues about size and depth, and in part about size contrast, as, as in the Ebbinghaus illusion. So the claim that I've been making is that we have learned over the course of our lives about all of these different cues about depth that enable us to make guesses about how far away things are. But at what age do we begin using these pictorial cues? How do we know that these aren't innate? How do we know that they're actually learned over the course of our experience? So there's very cool developmental research that's looked at the age at which infants be become able to start using these depth cues. So we know from previous work that infants are more likely to reach for items they think are within their reach. So in these studies, infants were shown a black and white grid that makes use of depth cues that, that imply distance. Two identical toys, two little rubber duckies, were hung in front of the photograph at the same distance from the in infant, but at different heights. So if the infant is not using depth cues, they should be equally likely to grab for each toy. If they are using depth cues, they should reach for the toy that appears closer. And the researchers found that by five to seven months, the infants have begun making use of depth cues. So those sweet little baby brains are already taking note of the statistical regularities, these patterns in the world, and figuring out what cues indicate size and distance. By five months old. Pretty cool. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you next time to talk about faces.